This week in the AFL, an AFL player tests positive to COVID-19, the Hawks bounce back in a big way, and the Blues claim a massive scalp in Geelong. G'day guys, welcome back to another video on the True Footy YouTube channel today, doing the review of round three of this weird, wacky 2020 AFL season. There's a bit to cover, more surprise upsets, and a very strange looking ladder after three rounds. Before we get into it though, I do just want to acknowledge everyone who got around my recent video talking about what AFL means to me. If you watch the video, you'll know it is quite unlike any other video I've done on this channel. I get very emotionally candid. It was something I did a few weeks ago. And to be honest, it was something that I had had in my head for about 18 months and thought about doing something with for the channel, but never really knew exactly how to produce that. And then one night I was just kind of lying in bed, couldn't sleep, and it all kind of came into my head in that exact monologue. So I just want to say thank you to all the support on that video. Some of the comments were lovely, and I really, really appreciate all of you. But anyway, let's crack on with this round three review. And the biggest story to come out of the round is nothing to do with football. It was the fact that Conor McKenna became the first AFL player to be tested positive for COVID-19. Now, when the story sort of broke, we were all kind of fearful that the whole season would be suspended because I think originally, originally we said that uh, when a player got coronavirus, you know, way back in like round one, they were talking about downing tools for two weeks. And then I think subsequently, they said there would be a 30-day suspension of the season if somebody got coronavirus and now somebody's actually got it. Uh, we're just pretty much looking at just suspending one game between Essendon and Melbourne, uh, I presume, until the next block of fixtures. So obviously, it is a fast-changing environment, although I do think the AFL have acted reasonably here and I'm, I'm pleased that they have contingencies in place and obviously I didn't want the season suspended but it does create a number of headaches I don't really know what the resolution is going to be particularly because at the time I create this video um, I don't know if other players are going to test positive or if they're going to be forced to self-isolate at this stage I don't think it's fair if say Essendon have to lose you know their back six or even more to isolation and they wouldn't be able to play games I don't think it's fair for them to play games but then how do you reschedule the games that they otherwise would be playing it's a nightmare it remains to be seen exactly what effect this has on the rest of the season in slightly more upbeat news we've got Matty Rao once again has put together what I would say is a best on ground performance and that is supported but I think it's the AFL player ratings rated in best on ground and the significance of this is that he has become the quickest player by their metric, to record two back-to-back -back best on ground performances has taken him three games. I think the next best was Sam Gray with 17, and then down the list you got names like Walters, Kelly, and Bontepelli, actual real stars of the comp. Manny Rao could be leading the Brownlow after three rounds. Against the Crows, he had two goals, 20 possessions, 10 tackles, and 104 fantasy points in a reduced game. Those are ridiculously elite numbers. For the first time in their history, the Suns look great, it has to be said. And while I would say there's a caveat there, I think they've played two very easy opposition teams in the last two weeks who played very poor football. You have to say this is the best the Suns have ever looked and I'm very intrigued to see just how far they can push it this season. To contrast that, we've got the Adelaide Crows who in my opinion look destined for the wooden spoon this year. That horrible decline from that 2017 grand final continues. As far as I'm concerned, you could see this decline coming just even looking at the composition of their list. I don't want to go too early because, you know, they might make me look silly by coming back later in the year, but as far as I'm concerned, there's a chance this gets worse for them before it gets better. I've made this comment all through the preseason and through the season so far. Their youth on the list, it's so raw, it needs exposure. Guys like Chase Jones, Ned McHenry, Fisher, Marcus, See, all these guys are just a little bit too raw to be starting to really add value to their side just yet. And then on top of that, they've lost so much talent over the last years, it's ridiculous. We banged on about it. But I mean, imagine if they had guys like Charlie Cameron, Jeremy McGraven, and Jake Lever all in their prime on their list right now. They'd be looking, you know, a lot healthier, that's for sure. But then you compound that, they've lost Paddy Dangerfield the year before, or a few years before that, and then to lose even just bit players like Jenkins, Ellis Yeoman, Keith, Betts, Greenwood, individually in isolation, those don't seem like big losses, but when you compound all of that, their list is looking very, very bare bones, and to be honest, I can see them being in strife for a good few years yet. Now, last week, it was the Gold Coast Suns who provided the ridiculous surprise victory of the round, and this week, it was Carlton getting the job done over the Cats GM HBA, which 
which shocked me, I have to admit. To be honest, the Blues were up for it from the get-go. They kind of butchered them early and survived a late scare. And in particular, Eddie Betts was brilliant in the dying seconds to sort of just get them over the line. This is the first time Carlton have won at this ground since 1996. And to be honest, not many traveling teams have done well there yet. You can play down the home ground advantage Geelong have over there. I would disagree with you. Look at exactly how they butchered Hawthorne there last week. This is a seriously, seriously good win for the Blues and a huge step in their rebuild. As far as I'm aware, they would not have overcome a bigger opponent for several years than what they did on the weekend. It's a big step for them and it would give them a lot of belief that they can probably knock off just about any team anywhere this year if they replicate that effort. Will they? I'm not too sure, but that is definitely one of the most impressive wins from a sort of lowly side that I can remember for several years. Be interested to see exactly what kind of momentum that gives them going forward. Now, as far as I'm concerned, they may or may not be top of the ladder technically, but the Collingwood Magpies still, for me, are the benchmark side of the competition. It is interesting that we have only one side to win every game this year after three rounds. It shows quite an evenness and only two sides haven't won. So Port Adelaide sit three games straight, but the Pies, other than, you know, a bit of a missed opportunity against Richmond, which they drew anyway, that's the only game they've dropped points in, and they, as far as I'm concerned, have looked probably the most impressive of any team so far. The Saints didn't play badly. They're not a bad side at all, but Collingwood were just too slick for them, and their ball use from start to finish really stood out for me. Now, you look at what Port Adelaide's doing, and yes, they haven't put a foot wrong, and they've been pretty convincing in their performances, but Gold Coast, Adelaide, and Fremantle are the three teams they've beaten. All of those teams could still feature in the bottom four. Yes, Gold Coast is playing well, but of course they played them like 12 weeks ago when they put in a terrible performance. So the point I'm trying to make is Collingwood is the best team so far this season. That's not to take too much away from Port because you can only beat who's in front of you and they've passed every test with flying colors so far this season and they're a sneaky chance to go 4-0 next week against the West Coast Eagles, that's for sure. Speaking of my beloved Eagles, they are once again dispatched by a much better team on the day. And if you're just looking at form lines right now, you'd say, no way is this Eagle side gonna play finals this year. Now, obviously that's a little bit knee jerk. I'm not gonna go that far just yet, but there's no doubt the performances are absolutely shocking so far. Now, this is not an excuse because I believe the Eagles would have lost these games on the day either way. But I will just make the observation, I think the Eagles chose the worst place for themselves to hub. I understand they wanted to make Victorian teams travel to them, but honestly, why would you pick the state where you routinely perform horribly year in, year out? We are terrible in greasy conditions. And I think the Eagles, the problem they face, and I guess the point I'm trying to make, is I think the flat track bully criticism is probably more relevant now to the Eagles than it has been. I remember about five years ago, that criticism was laid on us because we used to chop up bottom teams. This time, I honestly believe if the game gets contested, if the game gets slippery and it's very ground ball oriented, the Eagles just can't keep up with opponents and that's what we've seen so far this year. It will be evident to me if the Eagles play a much better performance against Port Adelaide during the day, if it's in dry conditions that they play well, then I think the flat track bully tag will be quite relevant. Now, a lot of people were talking up the Eagles midfield as one of the best in the league, and perhaps individually you can make that case, but you could also make the case on performance right now. It's one of the worst in the league, and that's where I also have to give a little shout out to Lockie Neal, who scored a ridiculous 126 fantasy points in a shortened game. He's topped the ton every week this year so far, the only player to do it in the shorter quarters, and to fact, the fact that he's maintained his average from last year is ridiculous considering he's doing it in about 85% of the time or whatever it is. Now on Thursday night to start the round, we did see Hawthorne bounce back strongly and make a statement after their terrible performance at GMHBA Stadium last week. And they've chopped up Richmond who were without Dusty Martin, although I wouldn't say that really had too much bearing on the result. This result, as much as any, really speaks to the weird results we're seeing since the return of the bye. We're seeing really inconsistent performances. And it's like I said earlier, no team has looked absolutely infallible since the return of footy. Richmond haven't come back well. Well, they had that sloppy game against Collingwood, which you wouldn't say was that terrible considering who Collingwood are, but to also go down to Hawthorne in that way was a bit of a concern. And then also Hawthorne to bounce back after a shocking performance last week. Every team pretty much has had a performance they'd regret already so far. 
in full flight, the Hawks are a great team to watch. I think Chad Wingard has slotted in beautifully. Now he's fully fit at the club. And I know Port will talk about how they probably made the right decision in letting him go. Maybe they did on an off-field perspective. But I'm, I'm thinking he's looking like a really, really good signing for the Hawks. Now, Hawthorne on their day will look like a great team. But obviously, the fact that Carlton went and did what Hawthorne couldn't do last week... There's reason to believe there's still a little bit of inconsistency. If they can iron that out, they will be a top four challenger for sure, in my opinion. As for Richmond, given how they started 2017 and 2019, I wouldn't be concerned at all at how their season has resumed. Now, the Bulldogs are a side that came under fire last week for two pretty bad performances to start the year. They breathed a bit of life into their season on Friday night against the Giants, and they showed a bit of character and fight in them as well. Honestly, 0-3 would have been pretty devastating for Luke Beveridge's men and probably would have turned up the pressure on him very early in the season for a guy who really needs to start performing with the list he's got. On the other side of the ledger, again, you'd be concerned if you're a Giants fan with those last two losses against the Dogs and North Melbourne, who are no, by no means world beaters on paper. But honestly, every team is dropping points right now other than, you know, Port Adelaide. So the Pies have two wins and a draw, so they're not even three straight wins. Richmond are 1-1-1. One, one, one. West Coast is 1-2. and two. Even Geelong, who looked like world beaters in round two, 1-2 uh, and two as well. So there are a lot of points being dropped left, right, and center, and it really speaks to the evenness of this season. So a side like the Bulldogs, who I just alluded to, who were a real concern after two rounds, are uh, level on points with the Eagles, Geelong, and uh, just behind Richmond. So still too early to tell. Now, i got to give credit where it is due to the Sydney Swans, who now go 2-1 and one after a very, very solid start to the year. They're a side that I pegged for bottom four or maybe even bottom two somewhere along the line there as well. I won't say I'm surprised by their performances because I've always respected them as a plucky side and a well coached and they have had a reasonable fixture so far to be honest but I, they must be happy with two and one. Away win against Adelaide. I know Adelaide are looking pretty average. And then an away win against North Melbourne is very impressive. And then only a one goal loss to Essendon. They probably couldn't have asked for much better of a season start than they have had. For a side with a lot of young talent and a lot of young talent that I rate, they couldn't really be going any more impressively, really, when you think about it. The, the spirit they're playing with and the confidence for such a young side they would be very, very happy. And next week, they're a serious chance to go 3-1 and one as far as I'm concerned. They're hosting the Bulldogs at the SCG. As far as I'm concerned, 3-1 and one would be amazing and would make me really start to doubt that bottom four prediction. Although you could use the Gold Coast example from last year. Although I don't think that's going to happen to Sydney. So to quickly summarize the round like I did last week, guys, I'm going to give each team a letter grade for their performance this round so obviously on thursday night we had richmond and hawthorne you got to give richmond an f for that performance against the side i would have fancied them to beat fairly easily uh hawthorne get an a plus for an excellent performance on the friday night the bulldogs get an a for beating a premiership contender a lot of people would say and the giants get a d minus not quite an f because they're a, a playing away in melbourne against a side that really came to play so they escaped the f there north get a d for a home loss against sydney again not an f because I respect the grit that Sydney brought to that game. And uh, Sydney get an A for beating a side that was undefeated to that point on their home deck. Collingwood get an A for a pretty clinical performance against the St. Kilda side who performed about what I expect. Maybe a C- minus is probably about right there. Geelong get an F for their home upset against the, the Blues who absolutely get an A++ for what is a ridiculous victory, as I've said. The Lions get an A for beating a very lackluster Eagles who get a D. I only spare them because, frankly, I would have tipped the Eagles to lose that, even if they were playing good footy. Brisbane are a bit of a bogey side, particularly on that ground. Suns get an A-plus for decimating Adelaide, who get an F. And finally, the Power get an A for beating the Dockers in Wet conditions, although to be fair, I thought Fremantle brought a reasonable challenge to the game. It was really one quarter that let them down, but nonetheless, they get a D. Anyway, guys, as always, I welcome your opinions in the comments section. Let me know what you agreed with or disagreed with, or what was an interesting takeaway you had from round three. As always, I'll be doing my round four tips video very soon on the True Footy YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe if you're new. Otherwise, I will see you very soon somewhere on YouTube. Cheers.